Hello, friends, and welcome to the Optimized Advisor Podcast, where we focus on optimizing the well-being and best practices of insurance and financial professionals today. On this show, our objective is to help you optimize your life, optimize your profession, and learn from other optimized advisors. I'm your host, Scott Heinela. We hope you enjoy the show. Dave Harris, my friend. Scott Heinle, it's good to see you. It's good it to be is back. great to see you back in studio again for our listeners out there. Of course, you and I connected on episode number seven. Yes, got what it. did we talk about that day? You know what? I think we talked about, um, I think centers of influence and how those can be, you know, big drivers of of your business and how do you harness those and how do you go after those and how do you maintain those relationships? So it was a good episode. And in the category of helping advisors learn from other optimized advisors yes. who we classify you as yes wow yeah it's it's a good it's a good synergy it's here. an esteemed place to be it is it really is proud, um, proud to be here glad to be back and trevor patching englishman vice president of business development the atticus group welcome thank you thank you for inviting me appreciate it's it always great to have uh, uh these in person uh, however, that's not always feasibly possible. So you're coming to us virtually, and we do appreciate that. We definitely want to get into everything Atticus Group, what it is, how the program works. Um, and today's presentation or podcast session conversation is really going to be in the area of helping advisors optimize their practice, right? So this is that shop talk category. We're going to talk a little bit about life insurance as it relates to business planning. So I thought we'd kick off a little bit of just the the, the elementary uses most common places of life insurance in the business world and then maybe graduate into something a little bit more involved advanced. and cer certainly exactly advanced um you know in our role uh with the relationships that we do play with advisors all across the country we're all too often asked about a lot of these these more advanced life insurance strategies and it's interesting because a lot of times you find that that although advisors have access to it, they're ill-equipped in the resources and the networking for them. Uh, and so being able to to connect people and network people of like minds of of the intellect and knowledge for these, I feel in many cases is is where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. You concur? I, I concur. All right. What there about you, know. you Trevor? Absolutely. You probably see all kinds of advisors, right? All walks of life. Um, well, yes. I mean, I I have my own small IMO, so I've seen a lot of advisors over the years. But mm -hmm. um, it's it's hard, as you say. It, it's one thing to have a prospect. It's another thing to actually convert that prospect into a real live case and get to the right people, say the right things, get it in the right order, and make the right presentations. It's 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 not easy. Yeah, and hopefully we can unpack a little bit of that as we progress through the conversation here. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't allow both of you to talk a little bit about yourself and just share your background and expertise. So why don't you start, Dave? Just tell us a little bit how you got in the business. And we, we don't need to drone on about this. Yeah, this we're, is short we're and make sweet. It short and sweet. Perfect. Short and sweet. Yeah. So I've been in the business for about 15 years now. Uh, the focus of the practice is all life insurance products. And I would say at this point, it's probably uh, half- uh, personal planning, so a lot of estate planning strategies, um, estate liquidity, estate succession. Um, and then as of late, a, a big part of my business is in in the business planning arena, which is why I'll introduce uh, Trevor in the Atticus group, uh, which, you know, on the surface, a lot of it is, you know, key man, buy, sell, non-qualified deferred comp plans, um, you know, things that, that all really all business owners should have or integrate into um, kind of their risk profile. You know, if you have a partner in a business, you know, how does that business get transferred if, if, if one partner dies? You know, how does that get funded? Right. Um, kind of spelling out these things. So, you know, in today's marketplace, uh, there's a lot of small businesses. On the estate planning side, you know, given where the exemption is, that, that, that pool gets smaller and smaller. But working in the business space, and Trevor can touch on this, you know, there's so many business owners out in 
in the world and a lot of them are, are very much underserved mm -hmm. and are not educated on a lot of the strategies and techniques that we we implement every day yeah so you know i, I it's interesting because <clears throat> you think about business owner putting your business owner hat on and just really understanding the profile of that of an entrepreneur a business owner it's like we're moving how fast in our daily lives uh, light speed light speed what is the biggest scarcity resource that we have it's time mm -hmm. right so that becomes an, just just the overwhelming challenge to begin with and then as it relates to my business planning well i know i have to have liability coverage i know i have to ensure the physical assets that i have right yep. Yep. i ensure the employees i do all these things but it's interesting because then when i come down to the most important element i would argue of my business which is the intellectual capital the key people within my practice the partnerships that I have, yep. they fail to recognize these these massive liquidity events and circumstances that at some point will happen to your business, but we fail to 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 tidy up or even address at all the that element of the insurance umbrella. Correct. I mean, if the drivers of your business are 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 really the core of you know what you do, how you drive revenue, so. To your point, I just came back from a board meeting uh, in San Diego for for a new company, and and I was one of a few uh, presenters. So, a lot of commercial lines insurance, um, some tax planning, but nobody's really identifying. Um, you know how do we how do we make sure that we're we're capturing you know the best talent? What are we doing to give ourselves an edge over our competitor down the street? Right. So these are things that that you know, you bring the light with, with these, with these, these business owners and say, Hey, th this, this is the piece that I'm missing. Right. You know, I need to make sure that, you know, Stephanie doesn't leave us. I need to make sure Tom doesn't go to a competitor down the street. So now it's thinking of different things to make sure you've got, you know, we use the phrase a lot in our industry, you know, golden handcuffs to make sure that they are, um, you know, invested and, you know, vested. We'll talk about that more in the business right so from their perspective using this as an example of this board meeting you just came from from what are they did they recognize any challenges that they're currently faced with from a staffing and retention standpoint or or just open it up generically it's like what we're seeing a lot of headlines but what are we really seeing on the street yeah so great question and, and i'll i'll come back to that and and again since this this show is really driven towards advisors and i think we always try to come on here and, and kind of educate advisors mm -hmm. on, on opportunities you know i was referred in as as the you know the life insurance guy right which you know to them they thought okay maybe we'll get some group life insurance on you know their employees right but when when you kind of go under the hood you know you realize that there's so many more opportunities to work in, you know, the corporate space right. with these small businesses. So it's not just, hey, let's buy an insurance policy on on this executive. What can we do to, you know, create all the benefits that we all know in in cash value life insurance for, you know, uh, maybe retirement planning for um, legacy planning for right. those those key key individuals. So, again, I go back to there's a lot. There's a lot under the hood if you're willing to explore it. Right. And again, you know, partnering to me in my practice has been um, the best thing that I've ever done is, is finding groups, i.e. the Atticus group and some other groups that, that are so niche in a certain space that you have an expertise in this field where you can come in and assist these business owners with with strategies that you know maybe you're not you know studying every day but at least you know the right questions to ask you can kind of see visually where the business is at and 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 offer these services to them yeah you know it's an interesting point and then i'll ask the question of <clears throat> you know all too often we, we we recognize that um you know we can't be the jack of all trades and master of none However, a way I can mitigate that is to connect myself with 
other professionals, highly skilled, proficient organizations like the Atticus Group that I really act as the coordinator, as the quarterback. Correct. Using that as a sport analogy. And so knowing uh, what questions to ask at a very, very high level, an executive level, and then from there, how to delineate and connect the relationships that I do have. And I, I would acknowledge that that's a big part of your your, pra- your practice. It, it, it is. It is. Um, and, and to your point, you know, you can't be an expert in everything, but you can align yourself with partners that have the same, um, you know, mentality as you kind of the same strive for, for, for perfection, the st- you know, do what's best for the client, but everybody has their own niche. And again, you know, having these partnerships and these synergies allows you to kind of have a little more bandwidth um, and have experts that again, are so niche in that arena that, you know, you're, you're ready to go out there and meet with anybody. You know, it's interesting too. And I, I, Trevor, I'd ask your insight on this is um, that's easier said than done. A lot of advisors or agents, uh, words that come to mind are control and accepting the fact that I don't know everything or have to present the fact that I am the know-it-all with my clients and being willing to to accept that no 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 this is part of my team these are these are this is an organization that is highly skilled in this specific area and I'm going to bring them into the fold here um do you see that as an objection and and I would start with asking what exactly Excuse me. Is what exactly is the Atticus Group? Thanks. Uh, it's um, what is the Atticus Group? Well, the Atticus Group was kind of has a history of about twenty years, but now, but the real Atticus Group's only been the last couple of years in terms of really taking the concepts and building a platform that we can now offer to advisors. And well, in simple terms, what, what we do is we specialize in executive retirement plans, CERT plans, and the mousetrap that we use to do this is premium financed index universal life policies. So that's the mousetrap. And I'm sure all your advisors, educated consumers, they understand how IULs work. Mm-hmm. And that is one of, one of the, the ways that we as advisors go to small business owners and say to get yourself the tax-free retirement income that you need and IUL is a good way to put your after-tax dollars in the tax advantages and so on so that is out there in terms of IULs secondly we have the concept of premium financing which is used by high net worth individuals to transfer wealth they pennies on the dollar use the bank's money to generate those that, that wealth What we have done as a group is combine those two strategies and say we can now offer premium financing on company owned life insurance to business owners and they can now get the same power or benefits as if they were a high net worth individual. They can use those policies either to power their personal retirement income tax free or and and this is the best thing you can then put your key employees or key executives onto a plan that you as the business owner own. It's your plan. You promise your key employees or key executives a benefit in retirement. The, the, the quid pro quo is the, the golden handcuffs. They have to then time served. Loyalty to the company. You stop them becoming a competitor. And you then have the ability to you know, offer them something unique, which is not out there in this environment. And the great thing about our plans, the way they're designed, is we're turning a cost to to actually a benefit. Whilst there is an initial cost to these plans, ultimately the the company who owns these plans is going to get full cost recovery, pay all the benefits that they promise, and get a substantial upside return on that initial investment through death benefits, tax-free cash flows, and so on. So it's a very unique offering. That's why I am here today. I've been, I am a financial advisor. I have owned a small IMO. I've been in the asset-based lending industry for 25 years prior. This is unique, what we're offering to advisors like Dave and many others to say, we can now give you the opportunity 
to really help your small business owners in a way that is unique. I'm not aware of any significant competitors that we have in this space. And frankly, it works. We know IULs work. We know premium financing works. We're now combining the two for business owners at a very affordable way to put these plans in place. And Dave, you've had, I've got a number of questions that I'd like to dive into from this point. Um, if we may, you know, go back, but you've had experience in your relationships. What, what I'm asking you in particular is, do you find that this is better served with business owners that are already pre-existing uh, customers of yours through their own personal lines of insurance, or you've done a buy, you know, a buy sell or a key man or, or no, it, it doesn't matter. This no. is asking the right questions, uh, profiling the organization, recognizing that there's there's merit in further conversation here. Yeah, I I, I think it's an open conversation for for every business over owner uh, based upon certain revenue guidelines. I mean, obviously, if there's companies that are you know not making a lot of money or they're fairly new, um, maybe you want give them a little bit of time. But you want to work with you know, established companies, but, but the need is always there because, and Trevor and I can, can talk on this. I mean, if you go to a business owner and you give them a solution to, um, attract talent, to reward top talent, how do we make sure that these employees are sticky and, and not going to leave? Um, every business owner would, would want to plan like that. So, I think the opportunity is vast and that's why, you know, the partnership with, with my firm and the Atticus group is, is thriving really in mm. this environment is it's, it's a very easy conversation to have from an advisor standpoint. Yeah. So as you know, when I came in the business, um, you know, it was all about estate planning. Okay. Well, as you know, you know, when you acquire insurance, you know, you're usually spending a lot of money, right? Um, you're doing a lot of advanced planning strategies and, and guess what, when, when you die, somebody else benefits from it. That's, that, that's a tough sale. That's, that's a very small segment of the population that, you know, cares enough, has the financial wherewithal to do the planning. It's a pretty small pond to swim in. Right. But now if you can go out to the business owner market and have these conversations, you know, you're more than just the insurance professional. You're bringing a strategy and a concept to them versus saying, write a premium check. You'll never see this. And this money will go to your, you know, your heirs. Okay. Well, you know, some people like that, you know, maybe there's a reason for it, whether it's tax planning or, or wealth transfer planning. But now again, from, from an agent standpoint, and I hope, you know, agents that, that listen to this podcast, you know, a light goes off and you say, wow, I've got another, a real good arrow in the quiver where, you know, at least you can start a conversation um, with those things, with those items. Hey, what are you doing to attract? What are you doing to retain? How are you rewarding the folks that that make your business successful? And a lot of times it's very easy to transition that over to the team at the Atticus Group where we can put together, you know, model a portfolio, you know, get a census. And we'll talk about kind of the process, how that works with that group. Yeah. But, um, you know, and through that process, you're, you're uncovering a lot of other things. Cause you know, in our business, when you start talking about life insurance, it's like, okay, they put up the wall and you know, no, thanks. Don't want to talk about it. Right. But, but again, it's, it's having another solution, another mouse trap, another conversation. And, you know, these turn into, you know, very large cases. They're multi-life cases. Um, they're, they're a great, they're a great tool and a great piece of business. So if I may, let's go back to the beginning. We're talking about executive retirement plans, correct? That's what we're, that's what we're terming it. Correct. Okay. So how, what are some of the advantages, disadvantages as compared to that of a more common retirement contribution plan, like your 401k, you know, the, these kind of defined contribution plans. So w w where do the pros and cons lie? Well, first of all, um, how much can you put in a 401k? 225 change. So you're an executive, you're making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. Yep. How's that going to help you when you retire? 
when you're putting all the max out that you can do into into a qualified retirement plan. Yeah, if I'm a high net worth earner making a million plus a year, what what what? I'm not saying we don't contribute to the 401k, but how is that really going to register on the needle in retirement? Well, the problem the problem is that most most people that in my experience they make 200, they make 300, they make 400, they make five, whatever they make. They also have a lifestyle that kind of fits that that income, and Correct. so the actual disposable income that they put away for retirement isn't enough to actually continue that lifestyle in retirement. So, the the, the concept is, you know, with our type of a plan, it's something the company is going to give you for free. So that's a great benefit to the employee. They have they just. They don't have to go and get another job to, to make more money. They just have to continue to stay where they are, right. do a good job, and, and help build that company. From an employer's perspective, why would I invest more money into that employee? Well, if you don't put more money into them, you're going to have to put more money to in, in some other way, shape, or form. He goes and gets another job offer, then you have to go and match that. He leaves, you have to replace them, and the cost of replacement can be up to 200% of that person's salary just to replace that key individual. So you get into this vicious cycle of, of how do you how do you stop this? Because if you don't offer a benefit outside of what everybody else does, it's simply a question of who's got the deepest pockets to write the checks to keep these people on the payroll. Or worse, you start then giving up equity because they're asking for, can I have a piece of the business now? And as you know, equity is the most valuable uh, asset that a business owner has. So um, you can look at it from a dollars and cents perspective, but ultimately, as a business owner, your business is your retirement plan. And the people that you, one of your key assets, if not the key asset, are your employees. Right. So you've got to you've got to take care of your key asset. And one of the things that we talk about is is this and we tell you know we do some we have a lot of relationships in the car dealership business and what we say to them is and it's true for most business owners do you realize you're only leveraging two-thirds of your, of your assets yes you have mortgages to buy your land building dealer car dealership base and so on you also have stock planning for your inventory for your cars but what about your key employees if you can leverage your key employees to get, you can leverage them to get tax-free dollars for them, tax-free dollars for yourself, create this family bank of wealth downstream that you can pass on, and you do this by helping them too. The biggest winner of our plans isn't the employees, it's not the executives, it's the business owners themselves. Because ultimately, our business owners end up with a big pile of policies unencumbered that they own, not the employees, that they can use for their business purposes and then pass on to their generations to create that family bank concept. So, you know, you it's, to me, it's not an argument about this is better than a 401k or a, or a, or a simple or a SEP IRA. This is something fundamentally different. This is how can I solve a lot of the fundamental issues that you as a business owner have? Can you now make sure your succession plan is properly funded? Do you have an exit strategy, regardless of whether you can or cannot sell your business for the dollar amount you want in 10, 20, 30 years in retirement? So this is a way of basically creating a plan B for yourself as a business owner. And it makes the perfect sense. Now, the next word, next question, the T word, taxes. For business owners, always taxes is very important. So I, I uh, generically speaking, or from a generic standpoint, can we just unpack some of the, the tax incentives or advantages that there may be on the front end for said business owner uh, and I imagine we have to compartmentalize that between a C corp or pass through entities. Well, um, our plans we use we use premium financing, so well, we don't have to, but we find that financing is typically uh, two thirds cheaper than mm -hmm. if 
a company business owner was to pay the premiums out of pocket themselves. That's a lot. That's a big two thirds. Huge, huge, huge difference. I mean, so the upfront savings is is enormous, and the reason is that instead of putting the, the the money in ourselves, we're borrowing the money from a bank at preferential rates, and we are still currently three percent or lower, depending on the quality of the of the borrower even given the increase in interest rates that we've had recently. So very, very cheap borrowing. So we have to pay the interest expense on these loans. Unfortunately, we cannot write off that interest expense. That's that's our skin in the game, if you like. Everything, but the good news is that everything we take out of these policies is tax-free to the company. And all the death benefits come to the company obviously tax-free it's life insurance and the other advantage is let's say i own i own the business i have a policy on dave 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 does his time served dave now says to me i'm retiring can you give me my hundred thousand dollars a year i can take money out of these policies i that's free to me as a business owner i turn around and, and start stroking dave his his checks for his retirement that is a tax deductible expense to me, just as any other employee remuneration is, is, a, is a deductible expense. So if you think about it in terms of taxation, it's a bit like a Roth IRA. We have to we have, to have after tax dollars or in our, in our case, we cannot deduct the interest expense on the, on the interest that we pay for the loan. But ultimately, everything else flows to us tax-free, and we still get tax deduction for anything we pay out to the employees. Now, the good news is, if you're a business owner and you have a plan on yourself, or, or even regardless, and you're an S corp, everything to you personally is tax-free. Mm. That's a lot. Yeah. And the other thing that we we do is, I can set up a plan on Dave. It's my plan. Remember, I own it as the business owner. I own it. I'm the beneficiary, and I and I pay Dave his money. Number one, I don't have to pay Dave his employment benefit from my policy. I can keep it. I can pay from free cash flow. Secondly, I can also use Dave's policy to pay me as well. And the other thing is, I don't have to wait till Dave retires. I can start taking money out of Dave's policy whenever that policy is sufficiently capable of making distributions to me as the owner. And that, that start point is around year 11. So we, although we talk about our plans being a long-term plan, the reality is we can set these plans up that after year 11, around year 11, we can start taking tax-free distributions to, to, to the company to start that cost recovery process to start generating money to do whatever we want to as a business owner. So this isn't like the state planning, as Dave said, but we're doing something for our heirs and beneficiaries. No, we're doing something for ourselves as business owners. And by the way, when all of this is dead and buried and we're long gone, our family will still inherit all of those policies, all of the tax-free benefits downstream. So we still have the same effect as if we were doing this as an individual. That's great. I, I get all that. Um, <clears throat> it's very, very interesting in the sense that the businesses of the owner, you've got the business as the beneficiary. I get to select employees who are the insureds for these contracts. That's how it kind of all works mechanically. I would imagine from a handcuff standpoint, there's contractual obligations, correct? Correct. And and so can you talk a little bit more about what those look like? I would imagine there isn't just one uh, one you know, size fits all, right? So depending on the makeup of that company, the size, the scale, employment size, employee age, things of this nature, the owner has the full uh, control over how they set that up. But I, I guess more of the question is where do they get that guidance from an intelligence standpoint? Okay, well, first of all, we we help them with with in terms of the guidance piece. So there is a the SERP agreement is is a legal agreement between the company and the employee, which is has no reference in any way, shape or form to the insurance policies 
that we are taking out on the individual. And that's important. That's there, is, there is, otherwise if we link the two, then we have a problem from the IRS standpoint. So our plans are informally funding those legal agreements. So the legal agreement basically says that uh, me, Trevor Patching Inc. will pay you, the employee Dave, X amount of dollars at benefit age, whatever, for X amount of years, and then it will have different clauses, subject to a vesting schedule, and that can be a great a great investing schedule or a cliff vesting. So I can say, Dave, I want you to work for 15 years before you become vested in the plan. I could say, Dave, I love you. That I want five years is good enough. You and the great thing about our plans is you can discriminate. And to, to be able to say, as, as anybody in this world, you can discriminate against your employees is, is, is actually quite, is quite powerful. So what that means is um, you can't discriminate by sex, but if I want to give my sales guys uh, $30,000 a year or 50% of their salary, and I want to give other employees 70% or 30%, I can do whatever I want to do. So there is no there is no one size fit all. I don't have to give everybody the same benefit. I can discriminate by job title, uh, by vesting schedule, I, dollar amount, retirement benefit, how much you pay out. You you very much can customize this plan exactly as how you want to reward those individuals. And we have sample agreements that we we provide to the companies. Obviously, we don't give tax and legal advice. But it basically fleshes out, you know, some of the key concepts, and we and um, and, and you know, it's it's pretty much a ninety something percent fill in the blanks unless there's any state law um, things that need to be considered. So one of the things that and then there's the other questions is what happens if someone leaves before they're vested? What happens if they die in service? Should I give them a death benefit and so on? So there are all these things, these little pieces. That kind of make up the complete picture, but we walk people through everybody through that so they fully understand what is best practice, what they can do, and what they can't do, and then obviously um, that's finalised through their through the lawyers. So, in most cases, you do. I mean, you would always advise gain legal counsel. Do you find that almost always there is legal counsel, or can somebody, a smaller business owner, that maybe is generating significant revenue, but simple in nature. Can they do this without legal counsel or that would be ill-advised? We would never say do not take legal counsel. We would right. always say take legal counsel, but um, a lot of our, and we, ha we, have, we have lawyers on, on, on hand on our side that could uh, provide you know, very, you know, some guidance as to what, you know, what this should look like understands well the size of the plan matters some of our plans are you know can be literally we have one right now we're working has a 72 plan person plan for a guaranteed issue software company um i also have one lady who run who's a financial planner she wants to put a plan on herself and then when she's gone through the process offer it to her clients mm -hmm. so i doubt very much if she's going to take a lot of legal advice because you know, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't have to, it's, um, it's making, it's really about making sure that, that, that you are not falling foul of, of anything, anything out there that we are not aware of that may pertain to your state. But honestly, most, it's usually a very simple cut and dry process. We don't get any pushback. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a non-event, but we always say to people, please do, you should. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the interest rates. I mean, obviously, interest rates, inflation is running rampant. We've seen the mortgage, 30-year mortgage, go up 250 basis points in, what, mm -hmm. four months, six months, certainly in a very, very unprecedented amount of time. And you made the comment that you're still seeing very, very attractive finance rates. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, how how is that? Well, I think a lot of people don't realize that there are actually two interest rates out there. There's one that consumers pay and there's one that business businesses pay. Right. If, if business was to pay an extra two and a half percent on their business loans, we, we, our economy would not survive. So commercial lending rates are, are different than 
would say interest rates for, for mortgages, Retail. number one. Yeah, Retail. Yeah, Retail. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good mm-hmm. for people to understand. Yeah, and that, that's the one is important distinction. Secondly is this, the banks who are lending the money are lending their money to an insurance to, into insurance policies and that money is guaranteed because we put riders on those policies so the bank has access to their collateral uh, as collateral. So for the banks, this is a, a zero risk lending situation. Mm-hmm. They, it, it, they're lending against their own cash. So that again really helps the, 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 the interest rate because who doesn't want to have that kind of loan on your books given that banks have different tiered uh, levels of risk and we, our loans are large. So we have they have millions of dollars of good quality loans, which really help support other lending on their books, which again helps keep the, the interest rates you know, very, very competitive. Have you found that banks have gotten tighter lately or no? Honestly, we have we have we have not we've seen bits at the margin. I said we're still sub three percent for a one year variable rate. We said somebody asked us for a for a fixed ten year fixed. We can do a ten year fixed. They offer it for four point seven percent fixed for ten years. That tells me if a bank's willing to offer that, then interest they do not they do not see interest rates going crazy. You know, in, in 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 the short, you know, in the near term. Right, right. Who is this not a good fit for? And I would say, I'll, I'll give the easy one: those that aren't insurable. <laughs> well, yes and no. So let let let, let, a let bit about that. Yeah, let, yes and no is the answer. So um, let's say we have um, a company has a, a group of 10, 20, It doesn't matter how many employees. We want to offer everybody a cert benefit. And one or two people come back and they're not insurable. Well, we obviously we cannot put life insurance on that life. But what we can do is we can we can use an aggregate funding approach to make sure that we can still give that employee that retirement income benefit downstream by by having policies sufficiently large enough across the remainder of the group to be able to facilitate that. Interesting. You know, Trevor, in, in your conversation, which I think is is a is a really big point for you know the business owner when you're having the discussion, and obviously every business is is different and and what their needs may entail. But you know, having these policies, which we all know are are really an incredible asset, um, on the books, and not only having the cash value. But also having you know the death benefit and those those future death benefits that 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 could be payable down the line. Um, but you know some of the cases that we work on together, and I know some that that you guys do outside, um, they'll the businesses will actually use those dollars for for a number of things. They could be used for a number of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with a lot of the businesses we work with, there they might be a potential exit involved, or there might need to be um, some additional financing involved to to acquire other businesses. So this is kind of in in the weeds, but I think it's very important as a business owner to have the flexibility and know that you know it checks all these boxes. We're doing all these great things for the employees, and at the end of the day, you know the business owner is reaping a very large benefit. From this, especially if they're you know sub fifty years old, but um, you know using the policies for acquisitions or using it as a strategy if there's some type of private equity buyout where hey we we want the business but we don't want to lose the executive team we don't want to lose these folks here can we talk a little bit about how those play a role in, in, mm. in the business? Yeah, so that's a great point, Dave. So we talked obviously about just cert benefit executive benefit plans as, as the number one there's there's many many ways that we can use this but the thing about the the, the one you mentioned Dave about acquisitions is when you put a plan in place you can put clauses in there which say that if we get acquired you as as the as the plan participants can become fully vested in the plan so we can accelerate you being vested in the plan. Caveat, however, 
to become fully vested, you have to then stay with the new acquiring company for a period of 12 months, 18 months mm. to then become fully vested. What that does, it means that the acquiring company has got a lot more uncertainty about what they're acquiring. The team's not going to walk out the door and then has the opportunity to renegotiate the terms of what they want to do going forward. So that, that's really powerful. So if you're thinking about making an exit in seven to 10 years, then you know that you're going to keep the band together for that seven to 10 years. They're incentivized to stay and the acquirer is going to see the value of the plans as well. Think about this though. I now have got, a, a, I'm selling my company. I've had these plans in place. I started them 10 years ago. Someone wants to buy my company and we, we agree a number. And it doesn't matter what the number is. It's 10 million bucks, right? And then I say, well, hold on a minute. There's a liability on the balance sheet, right? There's these employee benefits that we have promised them. It's a million bucks, two million bucks, whatever, whatever that number is. Right. So here's the deal. Do you want, I can, I can deduct an actuarial value of that $2 million of, of the, the things that you're going to have to pay them in the future from the purchase price of the 10 million. Or I have these assets over here that I have in a separate company because we always put it in a separate benefits LLC. I have, I have millions of dollars of life insurance and cash value to satisfy those obligations. Mm -hmm. It's not worth two million. It's worth way more than that. So what? What? So let's. You can. So you've got a choice. You can either actuarially pay me the actuarial value of those future cash flows. And increase the purchase price from 10 million to 12, 13, 15, whatever it is, or you know, I'll I'll keep them. You you, they, they, you have options because the plans that we put in place create a real asset, and that asset gets bigger and bigger as we travel through time, as those future cash flows become closer through death benefits and so on. That's very interesting. So a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up. The terms and conditions per contract can vary, right? So I imagine I start with business owner. Mm -hmm. Does business owner have to have an agreement no. in place? No. No. Uh, no, we have we have a situation, for example, a quick example. We have a guy who's, uh, I think he's in his 70s. He's a successful business owner. He has multiple businesses. They're all clamoring to get equity in the business. He doesn't want to do that. So he's putting a plan in place on them to give them um, I don't know, a couple of million bucks each in retirement mm -hmm. as, as, as a, instead of equity. Right. So uh, he can put plans on them and then his family ultimately get the benefit of those plans downstream. So no, you, you, you do not have to have a plan on yourself. We say it make, it's smart to do that, but in his case, he's too old to really get the benefit of, you know, he, he's not in that mindset of retiring ever. So right. um, it, you can do whatever you want. So uh, that's great. What about if I am young and healthy and I, I do one of these plans, but do I have to have the SERP agreement in place on myself? In other words, the terms, the conditions, or can I fully vest it tomorrow as I go along? And then I, I want to have Dave Harris, my best sales guy, also have a plan but I want to make all the terms and conditions completely different. Absolutely. Okay. And I would too with Dave, to be honest with you, I would. Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to behoove him from these benefits. We, we want benefits. That's right. And so that, that, that's, I think that's another important element of the, you know, um, the discretion and the BA, the, the capacity to discriminate mm. the contracts or the terms and conditions of each contract or policy can also vary yeah. exactly yes and you I can think, tailor this yeah and I, I think back to the business owner's mind you know that the ability to do that and and to pick and choose who they want to include in the plan mm -hmm. is, is a big part of this and having the flexibility because all business owners want flexibility yeah you know revenue goes up revenue goes down you know People come, people go. There's years I can fund this. There, there's also going to be economic downturns. Years I can't fund this thing. What about, um, I'd imagine you use the 72 example. Um, the 72 example, you know, they've got obviously a bunch of different 
you know, their census is dramatically vast, I would guess, right? Mm -hmm. So that could probably get pretty complicated. How do you help them navigate those waters? So what, what we, to, so in terms of, we haven't talked about the process, but essentially, you know, you, we, we, we explain the concept if they understand the concept and want to, to find out how it would work for themselves. We ask for the census, we get a census. And what we have done is we have built a tool mm. where we can input the, the, the census in terms of dates of birth. And then we run, we, we, we run it in groupings of by age. And we can then um, show in real time what what a, what the plan cost would be as on average for our twenty year olds, our thirty year olds, our forty year olds. We can show those cash flows based on do you want to start paying money out in year ten or twelve, whatever it is. And and so we're able to show, and we we run everyone the standard non tobacco on guaranteed mm -hmm. issue rates. But what we're able to show them is the is how they can design their own plan. So that what the model will do is say, okay, here's the salary. Here's the here's uh, we can go up to a multiple of thirty five times salary for for in terms of the policy size. Mm -hmm. The bigger the policy, the more expensive it is. If you were to dial the policy down, it'll be cheaper. If you depending, do you want to pay your employees twenty five percent of their current income as a as a retirement benefit? This is what it would. This is what it look like. This is what it cost you. This is the benefit to you. You want to give them fifty percent. This is what it would look like. So very much. I, and I, as a, as an advisor myself, I found that the real the real power to really selling to anybody is to give them control. Right. Instead of instead of us advisors saying, "This is this is your illustration. This is this is what I think is best for you." Our process is to say we've taken your data, we've put it into a model that will, within five ten percent, will tell you exactly what it'll cost you, what the benefit is to you as a business owner, when you can see those cash flows, and get and allow you to play with the parameters of what types of benefits you want to give to your employees, be it dollar amount in retirement, additional death benefits, and so on. So we put the control into their hands. And that, that, if you like it, is the power of our platform. Apart from the fact we are ready to finance and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we're able to show, show a client the benefit and they start playing with it with the, those numbers. And that's why Dave and I are being successful in closing these deals because at this point we're not selling anything to anybody. We're just consulting with them. How is the, what's the best way to get them the biggest bang for their buck? That's it. And that's what business owners are only concerned about. Yeah, that's yeah, tremendous. I mean, yeah, you think about the, the, the cumbersome element of it. It's, it's insurmountable for a lot of advisors. If you address this to a business of it's got 20, 30, 70 employees, I mean, mm -hmm. to model that it's so cumbersome. That's an understatement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the that's the best part about working with you know a trusted team that that does a lot of the stuff where where this is what they do every single day, and you're not building spreadsheets. They have these types of of systems already in place where, you know, if we've got a call with with a client and we've got the controller, the owner, you know, the CFO, everybody on board, you know, we can adjust on the fly and show them what these benefits are. Do they want to give a certain dollar amount? Do they want to allocate a certain amount of, of dollars to the plan today on the front end? So we can show that to the client real time, which one saves a lot of time. I mean, I would say it's cut our, uh, cut our meetings down by at least three to four zoom calls, mm -hmm. just being more efficient on the call and showing them the numbers versus going back and forth. So really our process is, you know, identify the client, identify the need, have that conversation, get a census. That, that, that's really the first thing from the advisor side is, is get a census. And giving that to Trevor and his team at the Atticus, they can model out what this plan would look like real time. And a lot of times it's a, you know, a follow-up call showing the numbers. Maybe we go back and we massage those a little bit. 
but now it's it's really expedited kind of the the idea phase to okay we're ready to go and and you know that's when we start gathering the information and and getting the financials for the financing you know underwriting the life insurance component and a lot of times when you work with a business owner and Trevor knows this it's like you know when the light bulb goes off for them and they see how this all works together they start thinking, I want to include every person that makes over a certain dollar amount because all we're doing is buying capacity. Right. We're buying life insurance capacity. So we're able to stuff as much money as we can into these policies, not to get technical, but, you know, SEP and pay fully funded, you know, non mex uh, is what we want to do. So, hey, if we can add on, you know, five other folks under guaranteed issue, we can do that and grow that pot that much bigger. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. You, know, you can't be everything to everyone, but I can know who to go to for certain aspects of our business. Thank you both for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Great being here. Any Trevor. final comments, Trevor? No, it, it's been a pleasure. Um, I, I thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be on this platform today. And uh, I just say any questions, give them to Dave because he's uh, he's become our our expert in the field and can explain to everyone how the program works and how for them. So thank you very much. Appreciate it very much, Scott. Thank, thank you. you very much, Trevor and Davis, Dave Harris. It's always a pleasure having you in. Thanks, I combine that. I'm going to now call no, you no, Davis. That was, that was like, like <laughs> Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terms. Yeah, that was very Not funny. the case. That was very funny. But just, <laughs> just to end on this, which I think is very important for advisors out there. I think, you know, partner with other firms that are doing very niche uh, planning in your arena. You do not need to be the expert. You do not need to know every uh, answer to every question, but this will help grow your business because now you have all these other offerings and you can be the true expert, not just the one dimensional, you know, life insurance agent, but now you've got another arrow in your quiver, whether it's, you know, finance surplans, whether it's ESOPs, whether it's, uh, you know, cash balance plans, things like that. Find firms that do specific planning strategies and work with them. Yeah, absolutely. That's very well said. How, how, how do our advisors or listeners uh, best get in touch with you? Uh, they can, they can either go, you know, via, via, via yourselves, um, or you can come direct to the Atticus, the Atticus Group, I think we're the Atticus Group, uh, grp.com. Um, happy, you know, my cell phone, I'll give it out now, is 561-523-3947. I give it out freely because it's been given out to agents for the last 20 years. <laughs> and uh, I, I have the right to answer or, or to leave a message. I'll get sure. back to you for sure. Um, I just want to add, you know, just a couple of things is that, a number one this is all we do okay so a big thing in, in, with advisors is are they going to steal my client are they going to try and take my AUM? are they going to offer them something else answer no this is all we do period number two do i have to become an expert in supplemental executive retirement plans and premium financing no you can simply introduce us to the client sit on the zoom call Say, Trevor, this is Fred. Fred, this is Trevor. And, and never be on another call again. That's perfectly fine. Or you can be on every single call. What we ask of you as an advisor is to be the client's advocate. Make sure that the client understands what is being said to him. Make sure he's asking the right questions. Make sure that we are doing the best for that client. Be the advocate. That's what we want you to be. You do not have to be the product product expert. Be the client, be the client advocate. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention, this is big. If we are introduced to a client and they become a client and then they refer us to another company, unbeknown to, the, to that advisor, we will still treat that introduction as the same referral from the original advisor. We'll still put you on the application for the same dollar percentage as you did the initial one. Any plan participants that we add to the plan because they recruit more people and make acquisition, the same deal. We are open, honest, transparent, and we believe in a partnership, and we believe 
We're not trying to nickel and dime you. We're not trying to be first to the email game or who made the first phone call. Everything that every dollar of revenue that flows from your introduction is split 50 50. That's fantastic. That's great. That's great. It's well, well worth, worth it. it. These guys do a lot and extremely professional. I'll tell you, their whole staff, Zoom calls. Um, I'll give a shout out to Emma because she really runs the ship over there. <laughs> ah, she'll love that. Um, but no, the, listen, if, if you open up the door to, to this group, you know, you will not be disappointed. Their, their follow up, they're, they're professional. Um, I can't say enough about them, and it, it's been a pleasure partnering with them. So I'm, I'm glad we had the opportunity to, to introduce them to your uh, listening audience. So, And a pleasure having both of you on today. Thank you. Till next time. Thank you. Take care. Bye, guys. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment, or review. Be sure to check us out on social media at Optimized Advisor Podcast. Till next time. <laughs>